Hi, I'm Arlen Walker, and I'm live from Pelham's Wasteland, and today I have got the first episode of the Merrick the Mighty solo campaign, a uh, solo campaign playing Era, the epic storytelling game, excuse me, in a world that is based on the world of Carl Edward Wagner's Cain the Mystic Swordsman stories, three novels, and a whole set of short stories. Yeah, we're going to get into it. So first thing, I have a bit of a question for you guys, and that is I have kind of two scenes on OBS that could work for recording this. One, this one, which is a little bit of a larger face cam, and then one without the face cam that just has the Roll20 camera in it. So, if you have a preference between the two, let me know. Obviously, the larger face cam takes up a little bit more um, screen real estate. Um, I think I'm going to leave it on this one for right now, and if you prefer the smaller cam from Roll20, let me know. But we are going to get into it. So, I've already done a little bit of work for this, um, this session. Um, I have created cycle one untitled, and that's going to be our um, stuff. So we're going to, I in fact created a whole series of random tables. Let me open up all of the different things that I want to have open and minimized. And we're also going to challenge rating table. That'll go there. Cycle one title there. Anyway, so what you can see on the screen is a series of random tables. I just made these in um, Google uh, Google Docs, the the uh, equivalent of Word. Um, just typed up some stuff. So we have region one d four, and then one d six tables for what section of um, that region we're going to be in so this gives us some good stuff especially for starting the game to have a little bit of um, structure a little bit of stuff to kind of come up with help us come up with exactly what's going on and then um, an opposition uh, table that actually is um, essentially three parts so there's one opposition table 1d6 and then each of these oppositions has a subtable that's 1d6 through 1d10 and then there's an opposition level table which i can do um, either 1d20 um, rolling each kind of specific uh, action each specific scene in the game or i can do 3d6 plus 8 for the total available points for adversaries that's actually what i did and this last roll that you can see here i rolled a five on 3d6 so i only had 13 points to work with so this is going to be a relatively easy um adventure for merrick in terms of the total difficulty level of all of the stuff that he faces but that's okay that's you know that's good maybe for a first adventure to um try things out and uh see what's going on so, back to the cycle one page. Starting area, I rolled a 1 on 1d4 and then a 3 on 1d6. So we're in the northern city-states, or the, the sort of built-up area of the north. Our principal opposition is frogmen. Extra opposition, because I rolled... What I, do, what I did was I rolled a couple times on the opposition to get a couple of results. In this case, I only rolled twice, once for the primary opposition and once for extra or secondary opposition. So we have Frogmen as the primary opposition and Regional Warband as the secondary opposition. So that's just, you know, Regional Warband is just essentially regular dudes, regular warriors um, from the north sort of Viking, Anglo-Saxon types. And then we have the difficulty pattern, and that is preordained because I did the 3d6 plus 8 roll. So I had 13 points, which adds up to three minion level challenges, two standard level challenges, and two elite level challenges, and no legendaries. So we're going to do minion, minion, standard, elite, minion, standard, elite. So, the gateway scene. 
intro, um, we are going to choose some elements. So the game master choice comes first, and then the player choice comes second. So we're going to go back to solo play. We're going to edit this and do some work on this. So the gateway scene, elements. We're going to do presence, GM, the help if I could spell. And then the player is going to choose, I think, Esoterica. Because that's one of the things that Merrick is particularly good at. Merrick is all right at presence also. Opponent. What is our opponent going to be? We are going to have the opponent be a Scald for something like this. Difficulties. So it's a minion scene, and I don't have the scald fully worked up. Let me let me pull the scald on screen so you can see some artwork. Northborn scald. This uh, do, 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 is our scald that is our opposition. So difficulties is only going to be two, two, one. because it's just a minion scene, and um, the Scald is not a particularly uh, threatening opponent even in uh, in a minion scene, right? The, the minion level Scald is not particularly deadly. So then we go to Merrick, and we do the match to die. So his biggest one, he's got an Esoterica D8, a Presence D8, and an Esoterica D4 that he can use. And then he has a presence D6 that he could use. So we're going to do D8, D8, and D4 plus D6. And in fact, we're going to do D6, uh, D6 plus D4, D8, D8. So it's it's basically impossible for Merrick to lose this challenge because he only needs to tie these numbers. So he only needs he can only hypothetically lose one of these um, difficulties, and that's if he rolls a one on his d8. So let us we'll save changes real quick, and then we'll roll the dice. So slash r d6 plus d4 is a five. So, do 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 result five PC slash R one D eight a one. Oh no, just what we were worried about. One GM and a D eight two two C. So that's what uh, the results is. So now we have to come up with what is actually kind of happening in the scene. So we can picture the scene we're in. And let me find, I found an image that I think is going to be good for this. The feast hall. We can picture the scene, laughter, riotous revelry taking place in this hall, this hall that is within one of the kind of small city-states that dot the north of this world, feasting, drinking on mead, all sorts of back-and-forth excitement, and that is all going on, and gradually we kind of pull away from this until we're in the corner and we see sitting in this corner a mighty thewed man, this huge lumbering presence. He has this sort of evil eyes about him that are unsettling to those around him. And he doesn't seem to be taking part in the revelry at all. He doesn't seem to be um, enjoying the festivities really, except for a slight smirk on his face and a little bit 
of, you know, every once in a while he takes a drink from his cup, which is regularly refilled by the, the servants. Don't dare come much closer. He's got one hand resting on the pommel of his sword, and he's sort of lounging in the corner, maybe even beneath a heavy hood. It's unclear if these people know who this is, but we know that this is Merrick. Merrick the Mighty, the adventurer, the terror of the world. And then, up at the front of the hall, this woman, this scald, stands up and she takes up her harp. She begins to sing and play the harp. And she sings a song of an ancient king. An ancient king who fell in battle and whose treasure hoard has been lost to the ages. And Merrick, his head kind of swimming with the heady atmosphere and with the mead that he's drunk, his first statement is that he realizes exactly what this scald is singing about, the presence the uh, the uh, the treasure of this ancient king desires to find said treasure. Now the GM gets to make a statement. So the GM will say that um, despite Merrick's skill and his remarkable ability with um, survival, his remarkable ability to survive both in the wastes and on the battlefield, this is when he realizes that it is unlikely that he is going to be able to reach Forgotten King's treasure alone and without aid. And therefore, he uh, has to... Um, he's going to need... Well, he's unlikely to be able to reach without aid, and his, he realizes this, and he kind of grumbles. His, his dour countenance becomes ever more grim as he's imagining having to share the wealth of this ancient king with other adventurers. But the third statement, and that'll be Merrick's again, will be to say that Merrick has um, the chance. Merrick is going to have the chance to gather up some adventurers, in fact, from this hall, to gather up some other um, uh, ready adventurers, some warriors, and some, some reavers and slayers to go with him into the wilderness to go find this ancient king's treasure. And that is our three statements. And so we end the scene, Merrick, gloomy and uh, giving off this aura of uh, this uncomfortable aura from his position in the corner of the hall, sipping on his mead and thinking about the possibilities of the future. And that's that. So... Next scene, summary, um, I'm going to pause the recording here real quick to type up the summary since we just sort of went through that, but I'll be back in just a second for you guys. All right, I am back. I just wrote up a quick two-sided summary of what happened, and I picked the elements for the next scene, the GM Picks knowledge, because that seems to be relevant to Merrick trying to find out where exactly this, uh, this treasure is likely to be. And the, uh, the player character picked fire, that, thinking that a demonstration of Merrick's abilities, of his, his strength, his uh, powerful ability as a warrior will be what gathers him a lot of um, allies in this area. So, his opponent is going to be natural reluctance of 
the warriors, shall we say. So, um, let's just call that opponent Northborn Warband. All right, difficulties. We can actually use, I believe, I made the Northborn Warband, yes, already. So we can use the challenge table once again. It is another minion difficulty. So M, what is the difficulty? So they have knowledge D4, um, but they have fire D8. So they're gonna use the fire or fury D8. Why did I type fire? I know why I type fire because it's the version of that in one of the, the base settings. So Fury D8, they're gonna use another Fury D8, and then they've got Fury D6 and Knowledge D6. So they're gonna have D8, D8, and D6, D6. So it's going to be two, two, two. Match to dice. Now we need to check Merrick. He has his Fury D12 is almost certainly going to be um, D12. It's going to be the best he can do from the elements. He's got another Fury D6. And he's got Fury D10 and Knowledge D6. So he's going to be D12, D10, D10, 2D. Six. All right. Save those changes. Minimize Merrick and let's roll the dice. So slash R one D twelve. It's a twelve. D ten. A seven. And two D six. Is a six. So that means we have to do. do, do. Don't. 12, you see. 7, you see. 6, you see. So, what happens in this scene? So Merrick, the next morning, speaks to the, the noble lord of this uh, hall, and he sort of steps up to the, the sort of raised platform where the Lord has his throne. He says, my Lord, your scalds singings last night awoke in me an ambition. Go and find the treasure of this lost ancient king. Now, though I know it may sound like a fool's errand, I believe that I know where this treasure may be found, or at least the most likely places that it might be. And so, I desire the opportunity to gather adventurous warriors to go with me into the wilderness to find said treasure. And, uh... The noble agrees to his uh, his request. Merrick gathers up his men. Merrick stands in front of them and he tells them about his plan, his idea to go get this treasure. One of the no one of the warriors sort of spits on the ground and he says, "Ha! That treasure's been lost for an eternity. How do you plan?" find such treasure. Merrick's eyes narrow, reaches and takes, holds his sword, still sheathed, but he's holding it at the ready, and he says, By steel and by fire, I will find this treasure, and we will all grow rich, all who accompany me. This man once again says, Bah! I doubt you can even wield that sword. Merrick, ching, sword out. The other warrior gets his sword and his shield ready. Merrick rushes forward and neatly, easily 
moving faster than any man that size should be able to move, leans aside from his opponent's sword stroke and cuts him down in one blow. And he says, anyone else who doubts my prowess shall feel the bite of my steel. But anyone who wishes to travel and find the treasure of the old King Osric, join me. And uh, a number of the warriors, especially those who aren't like of a particular status within the hall, they agree to join Merrick, and that's going to do two things. One, it's going to be the end of this scene, and two, it's going to give Merrick a temporary trapping, um, a D8 of a uh, couple of... Uh, we're going to give him a, a temporary trapping from the Northern Warband. I think what he's going to get is um, Fury D8, Knowledge D6. And that's going to be the the trapping from Northern Warband because they sort of know about the area a little bit, and they'll be able to to help guide the the company towards the treasure. So let me write that up. Summary: Merrick is challenged on his. Knowledge and fighting ability, but puts down the challenger and gains a temporary or Oh, so I didn't do I didn't do the specific um, statements for that one. So first off, Merrick asks and is given permission to summon warriors um, and to uh, put together a war band. Merrick um, defeats an upstart warrior and demonstrates his ability to lead. And then the third statement, Merrick gains a temporary war band trapping. So the next scene, what are we going to do? And we can't do a core. That wasn't really much of a knowledge scene, though. Mm, more uses Fury, but that's okay. So the next scene, the GM gets to pick again. So what is the GM going to pick? The GM is going to pick Swiftness, since we haven't seen that. And Merrick cannot pick Knowledge or Fury. So Merrick is going to pick... Um, Esoterica. Oh, and that should be under Elements. Opponent. What is the opponent going to be? I think the opponent is going to be... I've got Blizzard, Mists and Fog, Snowy Mountains. Let's do Snowy Mountains. Hmm. Yeah, maybe... No, I think let's do Mists and Fog. Let's say they're... they're All right. Difficulties. It is now a standard challenge. So, Mists and Fog, what do they have in terms of Swiftness and Esoterica? So, Swiftness D6, Swiftness D6, Esoterica D8. So, that is going to be in a um, standard 4 3 3. Matched. Dice. All right. What does Merrick have available for the mist and fog? Well, probably not his swiftness. His esoterica is a D8. And he's got esoterica D4. Swiftness D8. Is that it? I guess so. Um, so D8, D8, D4.
and he's not going to use any of his temporary trapping, his warband temporary trapping. So let us roll the dice. Slash R one D eight. Eight. Five. And the four. A four. All right, success for Merrick. So, what happens? Merrick gets three statements to get out the mist and the fog. So, Merrick and his men are traveling through the wilderness. And one morning, they come to a sort of valley. And they realize that they must press forward, press onward to reach where Merrick and the men seem to think is the, the sort of wasteland where the treasures of the ancient king ancient king's uh, barrow or um, his uh, particular um, site of treasure must lie. So first statement, Merrick says, Merrick and his men crossed through the mists and fog without any treacherous incidents or any particular treacherous incidents you know maybe one of the men gets lost at one point but Merrick and his men are able to find the man and progress through but then we have two more statements what are we going to say so let's say first statement is Merrick has a much better idea uh, Merrick has a sense of the way in which some evil will is working against him in order to send these mists and fog opposing him um that he uh he knows that there is something out there that does not want him to find this treasure and what is our last statement going to what is our last statement um hmm <laughs> Seems like Merrick could. Hmm. Merrick could say that he is, uh, Becoming, he's he's uh, working with the men, and they're starting to realize how um, how capable, how deadly their leader is, and so they're going to get a uh, they're they're not going to desert. There's no threat of of any sort of desertion or of any type of um, sedition in the ranks or anything like that. And so that the GM, so that the GM couldn't make that a challenge in the future. That seems good. Um, so summary, Merrick proves himself to his men by leading them through the mists and fog without great incident, but has a sense that there is an ancient and evil intelligence behind nasty weather. All right, so that is our scene two. Scene three, the GM gets to choose again, cannot choose swiftness or esoterica, and cannot make it a knowledge scene, or I guess, I don't know, let me, I'm not going to check the rules right now, but I'm going to read through the rules again before next time to see if they can choose to make it a, a particular knowledge scene again, because I think a knowledge scene makes sense. In which case, we can't use Swiftness, Esoterica, or Fury, because this will be our Fury scene, the first one. Since we used more Fury than anything else in that scene, that makes sense. So, the Fury scene, the Swiftness scene, the Knowledge scene. 
So let's say do 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 knowledge GM present. So this will be our knowledge scene, and then we will have a esoterica scene next, I think, and then a fury scene. Not esoterica and fury, esoterica and um, presence. Then our gateway scene we'll have to decide. All right, knowledge and presence. We're definitely doing the mountains this time. So opponent, snowy mountains. Difficulties. This is actually an elite difficulty now, isn't it? Because this is our third pathway scene, so it's elite. So snowy mountains, what do they have for knowledge and presence? So they've got a knowledge D8, no trappings, and then a knowledge D6. Oh, they're not so good for presence. Um, I'll let them use the presence D6 just because to, to fill out the difficulty. So that is going to be D8, D6, D6. Elite. Uh, six, five, five. Six, five, five. We're gonna do match dice. What does Merrick have available to face the snowy mountains? Knowledge and presence. So his knowledge is D10, so we're definitely doing that. D10. D8. D6 plus D6. D10. D8. 2D6. That looks good to me. Let us do our rolls. R D ten. The six, just enough. Is a two with the D eight. Not good enough. Those D eights have not been rolling well for us. And two D six, an eight. So that is six PC. Two GM eat. So, what happens in this scene? So, the first statement is going to be Merrick and his men are able to get through the snowy mountains without any particular, um, are able to get through the snowy mountains, not necessarily without any particular incident. GM is going to add a but the snow and the the mountains are treacherous. They're difficult to navigate. And Merrick is going to take a uh, minus two a knowledge wound. Um, and I need to look up how much the the knowledge wounds are worth or the the wounds are worth. Let me double check that. Um, real quick, because I do not have that table at the ready. Do wound. So he rolled, Merrick rolled a six on his um on his d10 so he's going to take a level three knowledge wound so let me edit wounded three Merrick is going to be at a D10 minus three for his knowledge after having passed through the mountains because he is uh, in unfamiliar territory. He doesn't know the, the world in this part of the world nearly as well. And so he's, uh, he's, he's 
at a loss here. Now the Warband has not taken the Knowledge Wound, so it's going to still have its full D6 Knowledge, um, which means that, that that could be useful if we end up in another Knowledge scene. And then what is our uh, last... Hmm... Presence and Knowledge, we've already said we're not going to take... Um, we're not going to suffer from like morale issues or anything like that. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. What could we say that is going to be an interesting thing for the next couple of scenes? Hmm. So Merrick and his men, they get through the mountains. And in fact, Merrick is able to... Um, what is he able to do? What would be an interesting fictional thing? Um, we see Merrick leading... The track through the mountains he is leading along and he looks out over the land and he sees something in the distance and in fact what he sees in the distance is a bit of a, a building something not huge but um, large enough to have been a building built by the ancient men what he sees is a tower surrounded by the moors and he knows not just that this is something built by ancient men, but that this could be the site of the old king's treasury. All right. Pathway scene four. We've got Esoterica uh, is going to be one. So the GM is going to choose Esoterica because the GM lost that one. And then what is our... Hmm. It makes sense to do Esoterica Fury again. Because that would give us a, um, that would mean that Fury couldn't be used in Pathway Scene 5, which would mean we would automatically have it available for the Gateway Scene exit. So let's do Fury. PC. Opponent. So, Merrick and his men have descended from the mountains and they're nearing the moors with the tower and they're, they're traveling through this uh, swamp, this uh, desolate land, and up from the swamp rise frogmen. Now, the frogmen are not particularly interested in fighting right now. They're really more just trying to drive them off. So, um, the frogmen, let me find them. The frogmen to do are under elder and degenerate races frogmen all right frogmen have a um esoterica d6 which under minion is just a one they have a fury d8 and a ritual and an esoterica d6 which is two one and then they have another d6 and a d4 which is one one so that's uh what is that one, two, one, one, one. So that's two. So that's going to be three, two, one. Yeah. Matched dice. Do, 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 do. What does Merrick have available? Well, he's got his Fury D12. So we're definitely using that. On the three, he has his d6 and his d4, and his d10, and another d4. So d10, d10 plus d6, d4 plus, and then 2d4. That's how we'll divide up the dice so that we basically got automatic victories on the second and third. And then we are going to 
um, roll. So slash R one D twelve and eight. Eight PC. Nine. The two. But in a minion scene, that is good enough. So, first thing, and let me switch up the images right now. So, we're not dealing with the scald and the hall anymore. We are dealing with the moor as our sort of environment. And with the frogmen. Yeah, so we've got this this more this swampland that uh, Merrick and his men are marching through, and they are, uh, you know, soggy and wet and um, covered in mud and and filth and all of that sort of stuff, having trouble finding their way when these creatures stand up out of the swamp to attack them. And um, so, our first statement, Merrick and, and his men drive off the frogmen. In fact, Merrick and his men follow the frogmen to the tower of the ancient king. And then finally, what is our last statement going to be? What is it going to be? Hmm. <laughs> hmm. I think... We're going to inflict a wound on the uh the frogmen Merrick and his men Merrick so Merrick with this kind of elemental fury is able to slash away at the frogmen and drive off drive them off and follow them through the swamps giving them no time to recuperate and so Merrick wounds the frogmen. All right, save changes. We deal a wound, and the highest roll was an eight. So we deal a D8 wound. That's awesome. Fury wounded the eight that's how that's how i put it wounded d3 three, wounded d8 so the frogmen are going to suffer minus one d8 on fury scenes so that is going to be really good for us all right last pathway scene gm gets to choose again gm chooses presence because we have to What are we going to choose? Hmm. Sun Esoterica. I think we might just do Knowledge. Hmm. But then we can't do Knowledge for the last one. But I think we will. I think we will choose Knowledge. And we will be facing the... Uh, duh, duh, duh. The Swamp itself 
as we're racing after Merrick and his men are racing after the frogmen, the swamp itself, which is now a standard level threat, is going to try to prevent us. Um, the moor is going to prevent us from reaching. It's going to try to hide its treasure from us. And it is, do do do, it has knowledge d8, presence d8, knowledge d8. So three d8s at standard is four, so that is difficulties. Standard four, four, four matched dice Merrick has. Um, as his knowledge d10 minus three or his presence d6. Hmm. He also has presence d8 for leaning his men. And he has a knowledge d6 and a presence d6. So he's just going to take d6s. So he's going to do 2d6, d6, d6. Actually, that's that middle one is a d8 for his bearskin cloak that uh, impresses the men and all of that sort of stuff, makes them believe that he can lead them through anything um, because he's, he's that kind of leader. All right, let us roll. 2d6 is a 6. That is a success for the player. One d 8 You can probably hear my heater going, I guess, in the background. Sorry about that. It is very cold here, so I need it on. Not, not very cold for 1. Oh, no. And one D six, six. So Merrick and his men, the first thing they're able to make it through the swamp to the tower and they get to this tower and realize that it is um, just the sort of upper levels of something that is sunk into the swamp. The, and that's what the GMs, so Merrick and his men get to the tower, statement one, GM says, but they realize the tower is just sort of the very top level of a much larger complex that has sunk into the swamp. Maybe even an entire fallen city. So that is the GM's response. So it's going to be much more difficult to find kind of what they're looking for his larger place. And then Merrick facing uh, Merrick responds. His statement is that, um, hmm. Okay. Oh, I'm rereading the wound thing, and it works a little differently than I thought. Um, Merrick will deal a wound to the moor, actually. He will make it less impossible to map, and his highest roll was a 6, which means it's minus 1d6. So, do do do. So the moor is um, not quite as trackless as they originally thought. Merrick is realizing for when, when they have to get out, his canny mind is already planning to return with all this treasure. And he, um, yeah, he's, he's got a, a plan and he's got a, a way to get out, he thinks. And now the frogmen, the frogmen have returned. So they are going to attack. Merrick and his men are sort of standing around the entrance of the tower and out pour the frogmen. Do do do. And it is going to be gateway scene exit. It is going to be fury. P 
PC. And the GM is going to choose Swiftness for his element, or their element. All right. So, the opponent, Frogman, difficulties, elite. You look at the Frogman. So, the Frogman have a Fury penalty, so they have Swiftness D6. Fury D8, Swiftness D6, and Fury D6, but they suffer uh, minus 1 D8, so they're actually at just D6, 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 which for Elite is 5, 5, 5. Matched dice, Merrick. Merrick has got his huge D12. For his fury, he also has his uh, fury d6 for his sword, which is definitely using fury d10 and fury d4. So d10 and then d6 plus d4. Yeah, I think that is going to be the match dice. He's still not going to use. I'm going to put the note for next time of his temporary trappings. All right, he's got his Northborn Warband still with him, available to do stuff. All right, let us roll the dice. So, R1, D12. An 8. D10. A 5, just enough. And D6 plus D4. It's a 4. Oh, no. Eight PC five PC four GM. So Merrick's statement he is able to smash through the uh, line of frogmen warriors. They, you know, were barely getting their weapons ready. They're trying to pour out of the tower, and Merrick charges in and starts slaying them left and right, starts driving them back. And that is going to be Merrick's statement. The... Do, 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 do. the GM... It's going to deal Merrick a wound also. So the highest dice used by the highest level is a five. So that is a three. So Merrick in the chaos is wounded. He's tagged, not horribly. And, you know, his armor, presumably he's wearing armor. His armor protects most of it. He may not be wearing any any particularly. Uh, he's certainly he doesn't have any any armor trappings right now, so he doesn't um, have any like special armor. But he does probably have you know a little bit of light armor on and not going about um, basically naked in the snow and the the moors and all that sort of stuff like the picture. But the GM statement is that Merrick is wounded in the combat. He is. Uh, it's tagged, he's bleeding a little bit, he's, you know, got some scratches over him from the swords, but Merrick says that he is still able to drive them back, and in fact, the frogmen are uh, gathering, they're grabbing their wounded and pulling them back and leading a trail of blood deeper into the complex. So, Merrick and his men drive back the... Frog men. Merrick is wounded lightly. And 
but the frogmen leave, leave a trail of blood leading deeper into the complex. Dun dun dun. All right, that is our first cycle of Era, the epic storytelling game. Um, the very first adventure for Merrick the Mighty. Um, yeah, it was, uh, on my part, it was a lot of fun. Um, coming up with three statements sometimes was a little difficult. It was much easier to come up with um, one for the GM and two for the player. Um, but I think in game, uh, in a as I as I play more of this, I think it's going to flow even more smoothly, and it already flowed incredibly smoothly. It was really a um, yeah, an excellent session. I think um, created a really fun story. We can maybe we'll do we'll do in these episodes we'll do a whole kind of story summary and kind of go over the whole thing that happened. Um, so we began. In the halls of a Northborn nobleman, Merrick, listening to a skaldic verse about an ancient king's treasure, and Merrick, his eyes flash open, and he kind of thinks back to through his knowledge, his accumulated knowledge of um of all of the ages and all of that sort of stuff and is able to kind of, he has sort of an idea of where this treasure might be. He gathers up some men, cuts down one of the, uh, the men who sort of questions his abilities and is able to gather up a war band to go off into the wilderness. He um, takes his men through some evil and uh, foul mists and fog that are sort of nestled at the base of these mountains and realizes that there is some sort of kind of uh, nasty uh, an enemy, a, a, an enemy intelligence that is attempting to um, thwart his progress. He, um, oh, I didn't do a summary for the Snowy Mountains, but Merrick is able to go over the Snowy Mountains. Um, he leads his men through. He um, realizes on the other side of these mountains he's gone sort of beyond the limits of much of his knowledge. He's sort of beyond the frontier, as it were, and out in the true wilderness, and um, his, his knowledge is going to be less effective out here. But... He and his men see a tower in the distance that they hope to be the site or a site of something important, perhaps even the site of the ancient king's treasure. Merrick and his men travel down from the mountains and into the sort of uh, cold swamps, the moors in the area uh, around the, the base of these mountains. They're sort of... Uh, stamping through, stomping through the moors, muddy and sweaty and, and uh, all sorts of nastiness going around. I'm sure there's all sorts of mosquitoes and terribleness. Um, and then a group of frogmen come up out of the water and attack, and Merrick is able to cut them down, drive them off, wounds them, and uh, harms their ability to keep fighting, learns a bit about their tactics, and he and his men follow the frogmen to the tower. Um, they go through the moor itself, and Merrick and his men are able to um, stomp through the moors all the way to get to the base of this tower, and Merrick even um, is able to kind of form a mental map a bit of uh, mental imagery about what is going on with the the tower and um, the moors and all that sort of stuff and where he might be able to, um, how he might be able to get back. Um, and then finally, a horde of frogmen swarm out of the base of the tower. They um, attack Merrick and his men, but Merrick is able to, Merrick, his men form up a shield wall and Merrick, um, leads the charge against the frogmen, cuts them down, 
Uh, he's wounded in the fighting, but he's able to drive them back into the tower. And in fact, they're they're wounded. You know, there's you know guts spilled and blood and all sorts of nastiness all over the floors. And it turns out that the wounded are leading a trail deeper into the complex, which Merrick realizes must be larger than he first imagined. And so there is, of course, room for more story next time. But that will have to do it for today. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the first episode of Merrick the Mighty. We are going to call this session... Um, what are we going to call this? Through the snows and swamps. The first cycle. And we're going to call this 1.1, actually, because we are going to have a sequel to this episode coming very soon that is going to be the sequel to this cycle um, and it's going to be the second half of Merrick attempting to um, find the treasure. The second half, or maybe the second third, or however long it takes, we'll do a couple more. We'll do at least another episode of this system to, um, yeah, to figure out what happens, what's going on with uh, these frogmen in the wilderness, and are they guarding the treasure? Perhaps, who knows. Um, seems likely, but we will have to see. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I had a blast with this session. I hope you did too. I hope you enjoyed the, the story. I hope it felt suitably kind of sword and sorcery, suitably kind of exciting and adventurous and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think this system, uh, worked pretty well for Solo. Like I said, it was a little tough coming up with three statements sometimes, and I really got to got to make sure that I stay in the fiction, I think is one of the big things, is that um, like a lot of kind of fiction-first story game um, type things, it's sort of easy to just roll the dice sometimes and not stay in the fiction, but you really get the most out of it when you're in the fiction, when you're, you know, describing the, the blood and gore that Merrick is spilling as he fights through the horde of the frogmen and all that sort of stuff, that that is um, what really makes for a quality session. So, um, I hope you guys have enjoyed, um, I will be back soon with more of this. If you want to get in contact with me, I am at Cows from Palace on Twitter. I am on anchor, anchor.fm slash Palms Wasteland. That's my podcast. I'm obviously here on YouTube, live from Palms Wasteland. And it would be great if you left a like or a comment or even subscribed. Um, something like 80% of my views are from non-subscribers. So odds are good that you are not a subscriber and are here just because like YouTube recommended it to you or something. In which case, it would be great if you stuck around because I... You know, this is a really um, a small but really excellent community, in my opinion. Um, a lot of really cool people here commenting and um, talking about the, the stuff. And I love to hear from you guys. So it would be great to hear more from you. All right. That is enough for today. I've been Arlen Walker. I've been live from Helms Wasteland. And I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.